what immediately set the temperatures uh, rising was the fact that we discovered that instead of eight events being under investigation uh, by the police, taken out of Sue Gray's report and taken up by the Met, in fact it was eight dates, 12 events, 12 out of 16. That immediately set the temperature up. And then something else happened in the chamber. Boris Johnson slightly misjudged the mood. Uh, that's certainly what quite a few Tory MPs said. There was Keir Starmer uh, in his reply to Boris Johnson's statement, trying to get inside the heads of uh, Tory MPs and winnow away at some of the worries that he knows they have. Boris Johnson came back slapping him down and making a what some thought was a crude reference to uh, Keir Starmer's time uh, as uh, DPP. So what you've felt today is that some of the momentum that Boris Johnson had built up over the weekend is moving away from him, potentially. Of course, we don't know yet whether that's going to mean 54 letters going in for a vote of no confidence. He's just gone in, as you said, uh, to talk to Tory MPs. I watched him have to squeeze into the room past Theresa May, which can't have given him an enormous amount of pleasure. He is in there talking about the need to be more inclusive, He's talked about how it's been a torrid afternoon. He's promised his Tory MPs he's going to bring back the, the Wizard of Oz, the Tory strategist Linton Crosby. We'll see how much of a big job he actually uh, accepts. But I've been outside these rooms before. There was applause, there was support, but it was slightly muted. Twelve potentially illegal events under police investigation, most of them in Downing Street, at least two of them with the Prime Minister present. All details are still under lock and key because the police say that's what they want to continue their investigation. But the scale of potential breaches meant Boris Johnson came to the House of Commons in penitent mode again. I'm sorry for the things we simply didn't get right and also sorry for the way that this matter has been handled. And it's no use saying that this or that was within the rules, and it's no use saying that people were working hard. This pandemic was hard for everyone. I understand the anger that people feel. But, Mr Speaker, it isn't enough to say sorry. This is a moment when we must look at ourselves in the mirror, and we must learn. That is why we are making changes now to the way Downing Street and the Cabinet Office run. Mr Speaker, I get it and I will fix it. And I want to say... And I want to say to the people of this country, I know what the issue is. You, opposition MPs, shouted. Yes, it's whether this government can be trusted to deliver. And I say, Mr Speaker, yes, we can be trusted. To govern this country is an honour, not a birthright. It is an act of service to the British people, not the keys to a court to parade to your friends. It requires honesty, integrity and moral authority. Whatever your politics, whichever party you vote for, honesty and decency matters. Our great democracy depends on it, and cherishing and nurturing British democracy is what it means to be patriotic. There are members opposite who know that, and they know the Prime Minister is incapable of it. The question they must now ask themselves is what are they going to do about it? Many of them knew in their hearts that we would inevitably come to this one day. And they know that as night follows day, continuing his leadership will mean further misconduct, cover-up and deceit. It is only they that can end this farce. The eyes of the country are upon them. They will be judged by the decisions they take now. The Labour leader's direct address to Tory MPs discomforted some who also didn't like the way Boris Johnson responded. The report does absolutely nothing to substantiate the tissue of nonsense uh, he has just spoken. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Instead, Mr Speaker, this, this leader of the opposition, a former director of public prosecutions, Mr Speaker, he spent most of his time prosecuting journalists and failing to prosecute Jimmy Savile, as far as I can make out, Mr Speaker. 
Keir Starmer's words were intended to stir Tory MPs to send in letters of no confidence in their leader. Boris Johnson's own predecessor sounded like she was on the same mission. What the Grey report does show is that Number 10 Downing Street was not observing the regulations they had imposed on members of the public. So either my right honourable friend had not read the rules, or didn't understand what they meant and others around him, or they didn't think the rules applied to Number 10. Which was it? Yeah. Mr Speaker, that is not what the uh, Grey report says. Uh, it is not what the Grey report says. Uh, but if she, I, 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 I suggest that she waits to see uh, the conclusion of the inquiry. But Sue Gray does suggest, even in her very brief update, that Number 10 wasn't observing the rules set for everyone else. And she goes on to describe failures of leadership and judgment by different parts of Number 10 and the Cabinet Office. One newly elected Tory MP remembered how he'd observed lockdown rules for his grandmother's funeral. Only 10 people at the funeral, many people who loved her had to watch online. I didn't hug my siblings, I didn't hug my parents. I gave a eulogy, and then afterwards I didn't even go to her house for a cup of tea. I drove back three hours from Kent to Staffordshire. Does the Prime Minister think I'm a fool? No, Mr Speaker, and I, I want to thank my honourable friend. You're going to have to withdraw misled. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister has misled the House. The SNP's Westminster leader said Boris Johnson had lied to the House when he denied the parties happened. Has lied and misled the House. He had to leave the chamber under Commons rules. Using parliamentary language, a former Tory chief whip made the same accusation. I'm deeply concerned by these events and, and very concerned indeed by some of the things he has said from that dispatch box and has said to the British public and our constituents. When he kindly invited me to see him ten days ago, I told him that I thought he should think very carefully about what was now in the best interests of our country and of the Conservative Party. And I have to tell him he no longer enjoys my support. Well, uh, Ms. Mr. Speaker, I, I must tell uh, respectfully uh, my right honourable friend, great though uh, the admiration uh, is that I have of him, I, I simply think that he's uh, mistaken in his views. And, uh, Another former Chief Whip was one of several Tories who tried to pin the Prime Minister to a commitment to publish the full Sue Gray report. Many have questioned, including some of my constituents, the Prime Minister's honesty and integrity and fitness to hold... Two hours later, the pressure was too much and Downing Street caved in. While Parliament debated the Downing Street parties, the head of the police investigation weighed in. One particular answer sent ripples around the chamber. You're quite right. We had a, a bundle of material provided to us just Friday, um, which is well over 500 of, uh, pieces of paper, about a ream and a half uh, we received, and uh, over 300 photographs. The historic achievements... By the time some loyalists chipped in, many Tory MPs had drifted out of the chamber, some to ponder whether 300 photos can long stay under wraps. The day had started with the Prime Minister in action mode, promising a policy deluge and a trip to Eastern Europe to discuss Ukraine. The Prime Minister's aides had said the mood had turned over the weekend. Today, it seemed to turn again. Well, in the past few minutes, the Conservative Angela Richardson has said she has resigned as the Parliamentary Private Secretary to Michael Gove. In a statement on Facebook, she said she shared the public's deep disappointment over the way things had been handled. Well, earlier, I spoke to the Culture Secretary, Nadine Doris, and I began by asking her what Boris Johnson was apologising for. I think he was apologising to everybody who feels that the culture in Number 10 did not represent the restrictions that people had to adhere to out in the country. And, and he was right to make that apology. But I think it's also important to qualify that with the fact that people were at home and working from home. Number 10 had 400 people working inside it in an office environment. But he is, he is incredibly sorry. He knows that some of the, the upset and the heartbreak that people have been through during the 20 months of restrictions, I think that's what he was apologising for. And he, is he sorry for his own behaviour? You know, for his own failures, going to that drinks party, the birthday party, all the things that are now being investigated by the police? Is he sorry for that, his own behaviour? So, look, Sue Gray has produced a report, and in that report she says no conclusions should be drawn. 
What has happened is that some of those, it, those issues, and you will have the list, have been referred to some of those parties. I mean, you know, when... But, but I'm, is he apologising sure for his own parties, behaviour? But, no, or, no, or, or is he apologising for other people's behaviour? I think he's apologising for the position that we're in at the moment. And, you know, he's been the most effective Prime Minister. The question is, is it OK for a Prime Minister to have parties that he attended, including his own birthday, being investigated by the police? Chris, they weren't parties. Well, gatherings, I don't it doesn't believe matter. they were parties. It, they don't have to have been parties. And, you know, the Prime Minister walked into a meeting and people signed hammer. I'm not going to go into the details of this. He could be issued with a fixed penalty, couldn't he? Well, shall we wait and see what the Mets say? If he is issued with a fixed penalty, he couldn't possibly survive. Let's could. wait and see what the Met say. One of the things the Prime Minister said today in the House of Commons that was basically untrue, and clearly untrue, was his allegation that Keir Starmer was responsible for not prosecuting Jimmy Savile. How, how can you have a Prime Minister just repeating fake news like that? Well, I have no idea of the background of Keir Starmer, and I know it's that he... It's not true, and the Prime I Minister know. repeated it. It's an old meme that's just repeated by... Well, you know, there were things that Keir Starmer theorists. said that someone who was the former director of public prosecutions shouldn't have said at the dispatch box. He didn't say anything he that wasn't true. He shouldn't have prejudged what a Met investigation was going to find. He didn't say anything that was untrue. Well, Boris I, Johnson said something that was untrue. He said things he that were inappropriate. He misled the House today. I, I don't believe that was the case. Well, it, it is what you're saying that Keir Starmer was responsible for. I don't for know. Not I don't know the prosecute. details. Well, that's what the Prime Minister said. Well, I don't, you haven't he shouldn't your word have for said it. it, should he? Well, I think there are lots of things that Keir Starmer shouldn't have said. Well, there are clearly things that he said that aren't true. The Prime true. Minister. Now, whether he was, the whether they were deliberate lies or not has yet to be established. But he's clearly said things to the House that were not true. The Prime Minister tells the truth. The mess have revealed that they've got 300 images relating to these parties. Does that worry you? No, not at all. I think the more information that they have, the better their investigation will be. Oh, and what about the parties in the flats, or the gatherings in the flats that are being investigated? I don't know if anything of any gatherings, so I the, can't really comment. Don't you think it's odd that the Prime Minister wouldn't confirm whether he was at one of the gatherings being investigated by the police? Well, as I've said numerous times, no one can say anything while an ongoing investigation because it could be prejudiced. No, I mean, no, saying can't. whether you were in your flat or not does not prejudice an inquiry. No, nope, I'm afraid the Prime Minister is bound by the same cons constraints that we all are. Until the Met investigation is concluded, we can't say anything. I mean, the truth is you would support him no matter what, wouldn't you? That's... <laughs> I mean, there are no circumstances under which you would say enough's enough. Do you want to ask me a serious question? Well, are there? Are there? I mean, you know, what would it take? Look, I'm not going to... I, I, again, I'm not going to talk about hypothetical conclusions from the future. I'm going to wait for the Met to finish their investigation and then let's talk again. Nadine Doris, thank you very much indeed. I'll look forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the former Scottish Conservative Party leader, Baroness Ruth Davidson, joins us now. Uh, Ruth Davidson, you heard um, the Prime Minister's ally there, Nadine Dorries. How damning do you think today's report was? I think it establishes several things. And the, the kind of scondropper, if you like, is the fact that there are potentially uh, 12 events that have happened out of 16 that we know about, which have reached the threshold for potential criminality. Uh, being in, happening in number 10 at a time of national crisis. I mean, the idea that because this has gone on for three or four months, you know, to take a step back and just look at that, that is appalling. And it, it makes a mockery of all of the sacrifices that people in the country made to stick to the rules, the rules that were being set in a building where those same rules were being willfully broken. But how, how many of those failings and those issues outlined by today's redacted report can actually be laid at the door of Boris Johnson personally, do you think? Well, I think, first of all, if you're the Prime Minister of this country, you set the tone and tenor of, of the work that goes on in Number 10. Um, you know, I'm, I'm struggling to think if under Tony Blair or uh, Gordon Brown or Theresa May or David Cameron, uh, people would think it at all acceptable to push the rules in a time li like that, it, because you just, you know, you would not want to get the Prime Minister into trouble because you work for the Prime Minister, you're proud to do so. Um, you know, we know that he attended uh, at least one. He refuses to answer whether he attended another. We know a third uh, was an event that happened in his own flat. Um, so, you know, I think there are questions for the Prime Minister to answer, but the real worry for him tonight, uh, if, if I was him or one of his supporters, like 
the stories there, is the fact that Conservative backbenchers listened to Keir Starmer in absolute silence. The fact that the people that were up making very strong points against him were not the usual suspects. Andrew Mitchell has been a long-term ally and supporter of the Prime Minister. Aaron Bell, the chap that, that wasn't able to hug his mother at his grandmother's funeral, is a 2019 intake, uh, uh, you know, owes his job, if you like, his place in the House uh, to the Prime Minister. Uh, and the really difficult ripple that went round the chamber when the Prime Minister refused several times to say that he would publish in full uh, the finished report when it is when it comes forward. People don't know that this is the end of it. You so, know, people can go out there and try and defend him from the Tories party, but they keep you know, finding that the rug's pulled out from under them because more keeps coming and more keeps coming. So what do you say to your colleagues in the Commons who might be wavering tonight whether to send in a letter to trigger a vote of no confidence. What do you say to them? I think this has gone beyond a case of the integrity of the Prime Minister and now becomes a case of integrity for everybody that's a, a member of the Parliamentary Conservative Party. Um, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, his colleagues and his supporters may think that he can hang on, but I do not think that he can recover. I think if you look at all the polling, he's lost the support of the public, he's lost the trust of the public, uh, and I think there's a really big job for whoever comes next to rebuild that trust. And if MPs sit on their hands and they let him wriggle out like a greased piglet, as a former Prime Minister said, what are the consequences, not just for the government or the party, but for the country, do you think? Well, I think that that's the exact right question, Cathy, because it doesn't matter what colour rosette you wear come election time. Uh, if you believe in the institutions of this country, and I do, uh, you don't want to see them undermined. You don't want to see them degraded. To have a, a fabric of a society, you need to have trust in the institutions that are there to both service and, and lead people in this country. And the degradation which is occurring day and daily as this drip, drip, drips on, is going to be so hard to recover. And at a time where the resilience of this country is so low because of the last two years, because of the difficulties that we've had, because of the, the hardships that people have faced, it is more important than ever that we have a prime minister that leads by example, because if you're not leading by example at a time of national crisis, you're just not leading. You know, I'm used to hearing you kind of in quite a jocular frame of mind. You you look actually upset by what you've witnessed today. Is, it, is that a fair I am assessment? Upset. I am upset and I'm upset because, not just because of things that myself and others that are in my close family and circle of friends missed and had to give up, but, you know, I was working in the Scottish Parliament. I had constituents that lost businesses. I had people that feel guilty that they didn't go to the care home to see their parents, that they didn't hug a friend at a funeral because they played by the rules. And now they look at what happened in number 10 and they feel like idiots. And they shouldn't be made to feel like that. 